All right, I'll introduce Eustace Mullins. We're on the ready, so All just right. go ahead. Yes. Uh, the greatest icon of American patriotism of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, his protege, or his uh, mentor, Ezra Pound, being the greatest icon of American patriotism of the first half of the 20th century. Eustace Mullins is probably the most famous or infamous man in America. Uh, not by his name, although many people understand and know that Eustace Mullins is the, the greatest historian that we have today. And when I say historian, I'm talking about true history, not the propaganda that our news media and, and our, our uh, secular historians have promoted. Eustace has been out of pocket uh, for a few years, about six years now that you've been yes. out of the loop. Since my trip to Jekyll Island. Since your trip to Jekyll Island. Uh, do you want to tell us about your trip to Jekyll Island? Well, I went down to Jekyll Island to do some more research on my own, alone, and uh, after a couple of days, I woke up down there. I was completely disoriented. I didn't know where I was. And I started driving my car home, and uh, I was driving on the wrong side of the road. Well, let me, let me ask you this. You went down to Jekyll Island to do some research. Yes. Now, Jekyll Island's where this whole thing started, yes. the Federal Reserve and, in the, and uh, whatnot. In the Jekyll Island Club, the whole meeting was hatched at the Jekyll Island and, Club. And most people know that, but it's important to know where you were and what you were doing well, when that, all this began. That brass plaques on the uh, uh, club commemorating this event. And another important uh, ingredient here, a piece of the puzzle, Whose room were you staying in by chance? I had called a travel agent in, the, in Atlanta, Georgia, to get a, a reservation. And she said, I'm going to upgrade your reservation from a room to a suite. And uh, so when I got down there, she'd give me J.P. Morgan's tower room. <laughs> it was a I was in the snow What's room by myself. <laughs> So in the midst of your investigation, all of a sudden, sudden something happens to you. <clears throat> something happened to, to my nervous system. I didn't know what I was doing. This is what everybody thinks was his alleged stroke, or the result of, of his alleged stroke. And you were, uh, you headed north home. Yes. I had 700 miles to go back to my home. And I in Stanton, didn't Virginia. Drive my car. And the state police and the uh, every sheriff was stopping me every half mile and uh, testing me for everybody was calling in a drunk driver coming down on the wrong side of the road. Now they didn't stop, they stopped you and then let you go. They didn't incarcerate you or? No, because they tested me for alcohol and I hadn't had a drink for 30 years. Now you were on the wrong side of the highway. Yeah. Uh, Going, coming into ongoing traffic, how many how many vehicles were you aware of that had to get out of the way? Oh, they were dodging me all the way. <laughs> Big trucks coming head on at me. And hey. 700 miles of this, and cops stopping you in each state along the way. And they never stopped me from driving at all, because they intended to get, to get rid of me. And I made it through, I drove all the way home. Well, how, what, what was done, do you think, to you in, when you overnight in the bed to make you behave like that? Did they give you some kind of drug? Well, they gave me some kind of drug. It absolutely affected my whole nervous system. That's your thoughts? Yes. <clears throat> uh, either that or it's, it's an incredible coincidence that it happened at Jekyll Island in J.P. Morgan's room, and, and you were in, in great health until that time. I was in Perry now. I've been working 15 hours a day for the last 10 years. That's when I wrote all my books. So now you have an alleged stroke yeah. which affected the right side of your body and not the left side. Well, the principal effect was in my speech. It uh, knocked out my speech. I had no control over it. And I 
would search for a name, I couldn't think of it. Because the uh, connecting tissues were all screwed up. Now all those in your thinking processes have returned. So completed my memory, everything is done. And back full force. But your bodily, uh, your legs and your arms and whatnot, you still have. I can't depend on my legs. I can get up out of a chair and stand up and I go backwards all the way. Your equilibrium is totally yeah, I destroyed. Have no control of that. Exactly how long ago did this happen? This was in 03? 03. 2003. I see. It Six years happened. ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, whether deliberate or by coincidence, uh, if it's a coincidence, it's a, an, an incredible coincidence. Uh, if it's deliberate, there's no proof. There's no proof of anything. But when you got <clears throat> back, some of your family was ready to incarcerate you into a nursing home and took your power of attorney? My brothers, my two younger brothers, had been uh, had their eye on me for a long time, and they got my power of attorney and took over all my assets and they confiscated them. I had a $650,000 stock, stock portfolio. What? $650,000 what? Stock portfolio. Oh, okay, all right. I had a good, very good <laughs> stock broker. And I invested thirty thousand dollars with him. And uh, in a year he built that up to six hundred and fifty thousand wow. dollars. So my brothers were absolutely slavery and they thought of getting their hands on this money. They cashed in my life insurance policy and my stock portfolio and walked away with it. And took your checking account. And my checking account. And uh, yes. Put you in a nursing home. And put me in a series of five nursing homes. And each one was a complete nightmare. Now you were agreed to this going into these nursing homes or were you stuck there? I was stuck there. I had no choice whatsoever. I never consulted on one of them. But I haven't been in a nursing home since. Uh, Jesse got me out of one and we hit the road and we don't know what it says. <laughs> and I, uh, I had an alarm back from me in Texas because a court, uh, a court hearing uh, placed me under a guardian of an litem, and that was to be in complete charge of me. Well, that never was confirmed, or that never was uh, adjudicated by the court. Oh, no. Um, but a man had taken you from Virginia out to Texas. Yes under the pretext of the pretense of publishing more of your books. Oh, yes. And you were, you were going to help him and he was going to help you. Well, he actually wanted all of my copyrights and I was going to hand them over to him. Well, that was his idea that you would hand them over. Oh, and yes. You fought that idea from March when he took you out there until uh, September. And then the point of attack I uh, became, with John Thurman, became to separate me and Jesse. Well, that was a that was another story later on. Yes. Uh, but the one in Texas, you were in, incarcerated into a, a nursing home there after going to the hospital. Oh, yeah. They had you on Seroquel and, and other drugs, seven <coughs> different kinds of drugs they had you on. Oh, they loaded me up. And this uh, Seroquel is a very powerful it's called a chemical lobotomy. It's considered a, a chemical lobotomy, which destroys part, that's the controlling drug that they use in, in hospitals and in nursing homes to control their patients. Wow. And what is the name of this chemical? It's Seroquel. Seroquel. It's a, a pharmaceutical uh, chemical that a prescription drug is what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the purpose of it is to uh, make you controllable, make patients controllable. So they had him on that. While he's under the Seroquel, this person that took him to Texas, his first name is Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark didn't have him on the Seroquel, but while he's under the, the Seroquel, this was after 
seven months of him trying to get your uh, power of attorney over your finances and medical. Oh, yeah. So I went up to see him, and I, I spent a month with him uh, camping out on his living room floor and, uh, and realized that he was indeed in trouble. Each time that I would leave and go back home, he would wind up two different times. He wound up in the hospital the next day after I left. Uh, and then the, the second time, the hospital sent him over to the nursing home to, uh, uh, and incarcerated him there for 22 days. And at the end of that time, this person that had taken him to Texas to start with saw his uh, golden goose fly in the coop. So he was pulling all stops uh, to keep him there. So while he was under this drug, Seroquel, which is a numbing, a dumbing down drug, a controlling drug. It's a, it's a, a chemical lobotomy. It's a chemical lobotomy. You say, which was good cuts off the frontal lobes of your brain, that's, that's which are the command, the command right, center, the your, command your, center brain. your brain. Yeah. And that's the purpose for it. But while he was under that, is um, Mark was able to go to the nursing home with his with his uh, well, you think you notary know wife is that what you're telling me? and his daughter and son-in-law as witnesses and got a power of attorney signed from him which is illegitimate and, and has no bearing, he used that as the ruse to get him out of the nursing home. And he took him out and unbeknownst to us went to a, well, are they wrong a Mexican or lawyer, Mexican lawyer and got it done okay. legally with a uh, with the Mexican's notary. Well, let me have you talk about the then they department. took those papers to court and before a judge, and the judge was uh, along with the, the social worker in the state of Texas. And they were one day, from what we understand, they were one day from getting the guardian ad item, guardianship ad item over him. They would have put, so, uh, we'll uh, it Mark there. has these legitimate signed power of attorney over his medical and his pharmaceutical. And was one day away from turning guardianship ad item over to the social worker of the state of Texas. Once they did that, they would incarcerate him into a Texas state nursing home, out of this a private nursing home. And what do you call the nursing homes? A uh, mental institution. They're a mental institute. Once you're there, you can't get out. You can't get out. It's a done guardian, deal. Uh, That's a guardianship from yeah. you from now on. Well, uh, a second chemical that they use in the mental institutions, that is Thorazine. Thorazine. Thorazine is a very powerful uh, chemical okay. which affects the nervous system. Well, I don't, like I don't know that you were under that. I don't know either. There were, there were six other drugs, and I've got a list of all the drugs, and I don't remember that uh, being sure to come out but I know Seroquel okay, was one of the main ingredients yes. for uh, drugs. Thorazine has been used for a long time in the mental institutions to... Uh, but I don't know that... Right. I don't know that that... That, that that's what he was on. That's what he was right. on. That's right. standard procedure, Thorazine. And uh, I've seen on television, they do it. Uh, a, a wild patient, completely out of control, they go to shot the arm, they falls up and goes to the floor, just like that. And maybe that was planned, but as far as we know, that had no well, bearing on you know or your health. If I ever used Tarzan or not. But the effect on me, just the effect of Tarzan. Well, now that was the kind of effect that had from the Jekyll Island deal. Yes. So who knows? Who knows what happened there? But anyway, uh, Matt Mater, his grandnephew in uh, Stuart Strath. Virginia and I worked together uh, with L.T. Patterson in Cincinnati and we got him, I got him out of the nursing home. I was the legs and the 
and the steer of the, the vehicle that, or the car that we uh, left Texas with, I got him out of the nursing home. By their good graces, they let him go. Uh, the nursing home did. We left. So we were totally legal. We weren't doing anything illegal by the state of Texas or uh, the federal governments. We weren't escaping that anybody's jurisdiction that they had a legal jurisdiction over him. You're uh, lucky that uh, 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 Andrew Hoover wasn't around. Yes, who claimed he was the most dangerous <laughs> man in America. Well, I had Jack Hoover, for all I know, was running the whole operation. <laughs> Except Jay. <laughs> yes. Uh, but anyway, we left there, came to Virginia, got everything uh, redone with new power of attorneys, Opal, which his nephew has, uh, which includes his uh, copyrights on all of his books, which were the main thing that was in jeopardy, we feel. We came out to Virginia uh, a month ago and went through your warehouses. you want to tell that story? Well, in the backs of these warehouses, we found all of our uh, lost books. About, uh, about 300 cases. Mint condition. They were all there. That's the way the man had unloaded them. When I brought them. <coughs> had Matt Mayer been in charge of these books? Oh, yeah. He delivered them. Yeah. Well, he had been in charge, but uh, Eustace is the one that stored the books and then stored on top of the books many. Antique and uh, Oriental uh, rugs and uh, a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the books he had six six warehouses, many storage warehouses, crammed full of stuff in the books underneath. So we came out. Matt and I went through all the warehouses. We consolidated six warehouses down to two, and all we have in those two warehouses are his books, which include uh, Secrets of the Federal Reserve. A writ for mortars, murder by injection, rape of justice, uh, curse of Canaan, and the world order. And the biography of Pound. And the biography of, of uh, Ezra Pound, but we only had two cases of that. And so we've been treating them like gold, and, and they're, uh, I think you've got one of those. I actually printed that book in 59, and it uh, sold out immediately. And a guy in uh, L.A. plagiarized the book, and he, he printed 3,000 copies. Who's that, Morrison? He had no money. Anger press. I know him. Is he still in jail? I don't know if he's in jail or dead or what. He's a well-known book pirate. Oh, yeah. He and other pirates have, have taken your books. Another man from California. Oh, yes. Uh, They're all there. Printed a thousand of the curse of Canaan. Oh yeah, that was a, uh, uh, a Dr. Uh, uh, Spencer. Who? Dr. Fred Spencer. Of San Francisco. He printed a thousand of my co copies of my uh, curse of Canaan. It may not be a good idea to, to name some names. <laughs> Well, and all this. But that, that is the name. Another man uh, plagiarized your your uh, secrets of the Federal Reserve, and the title of it has Jekyll Island in it. Uh, <laughs> something about a monster from Jekyll Island, or, or somewhere a creature. similar to that. Creature, creature. creature from Jekyll Island. By, uh, uh, well, we maybe we don't want to name that book. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Uh, or that, or that person. <laughs> That's Ed Rankin. Yeah, Ed Rankin will be a good name. So, so, so while we're on this, for the for the record, then, uh, Mr. Marlins, you were the first to to expose the Federal Reserve. The very first. And what year was that? You wrote the book, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. Is that is it was, that the it title? It was known as the Federal Reserve Conspiracy, wasn't it? The very first title. It's the one that became Secrets of the Federal Reserve. It had several titles before that. The second title was Mullins on the Federal Reserve. Oh, it's the same book then. The same oh, I book. see. Just 
and when was that written? What what year was that? Uh, 1950. 1950. 52. 52. 52. There it is. Why don't uh, we Why don't we state? Uh, your beginning was with Ezra Pound. Oh, yes. And the, the date that you met Ezra Pound, uh, I forget exact, the exact date, but it was April 1949, which was 60 years ago this year. It, it's St. Elizabeth's uh, Hospital right here in D.C. At, at the Looney Bin. At the Looney Bin. And they had him locked up under what uh, charges? No, no charges whatsoever. There was wow. one shred of evidence against him. And well, there, there was a charge, but never was made an official charge yeah. because they knew they couldn't. Well, that, that, that charge was drawn up by LJS. Is that right? He had nine counts uh, and I think pound for uh, conspiring to aid and, uh, and, and help uh, and, and enter the United States in wartime, which had the capital in it. Uh, so he was under sentence of death, but was never sentenced. He was never, never been tried. And Ezra told me, he said, eventually the Justice Department would withdraw all these charges. And I thought that was pure fantasy on his part, but they're not going to be to true. Because I took a newspaper man, a friend of mine, he was the editor of the Washington Post, Rex Herbert Lampton. And he was an old newspaper family. And on a whim, I took him to meet Ezra one day at the hospital. Well, now, where was, it's important to know where he was at this time when you took He was a patient, a schizophrenic, uh, confined at the hospital in school. So he was a patient at St. Elizabeth's. And it was strictly forbidden for the patients to visit each other at the hospital. And, and St. Elizabeth's is a pretty big place. How far apart were they? Uh, they were about a mile apart. As was in Chesapeake, and uh, uh, I don't think it was quite a mile. Not quite a mile because it, these were sweeping green lawns of Norbert Hall. So it was in the confines of St. Elizabeth's. In the confines. And. Uh, and I walked right over to, uh, to Ezra and his wife, Dorothy Pound, and uh, introduced them, him to them. And uh, they absolutely embraced each other at the first meeting. They never seen it before. They did all the weddings for us. And uh, so they began a friendship, which resulted in uh, Rex getting this um, congressman friend of his to go on the floor of Congress and ask the question, why is the government holding its stand? Well, what, did, what did Rex uh, recognize in that first visit? Yeah, this has been five minutes. Well, <laughs> he told uh, Ezra right away. Just a minute. And talked let, to him. Let Jim get through and, huh? and then tell the story. There's something so, so what was it that Rex rec recognized? Rex said right away, he talked to him for a minute, he said, you don't belong in here. And Ezra said, I know that. And he said, well, I can do something about it. Because he knew everyone in Washington. His best friend was uh, George Simpson, who had founded the National Press Club. Why don't you state again who Rex was? Rex was a, a son of an old line newspaper editor himself in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. And what was his, what was Rex's job at the time? Uh, he was the editor of the Washington Post. So, so the editor of the Washington Post is incarcerated in St. Elizabeth. Yes. You uh, got the two to meet. Well, I got them together. Rex and Ezra Pound. And in three days, they had Ezra out of the St. Elizabeth. They dropped all the charges, and he walked free, and they abandoned all pretense of the phony charge that it was insane, because he was the most brilliant man in the world. We skipped a little bit. Go back to uh, what Rex did. 
he got this congressman from North Dakota. Yeah, he went to him directly. And uh, the going charge for that here in Washington is sort of just out of knowledge. Next time we should do it over here. You're right. Rex went to this friend of his and uh, got him to speak up on I think it was Usher Verdict, right? Usher Verdict. Usher Verdict in North Dakota. North Dakota, Idaho. Uh, I know it's from North Dakota. Yeah, North Dakota. The only congressman from North Dakota, which is a very small state, and um, a large state with small population. And um, I think the entire state has no Jewish people or black people in it. Yeah. Which meant had a secure uh, seat in Congress, nobody could touch him. And so, he went to Congress, and what did he tell Congress? He got on the floor of Congress, and he asked the question, why is the government holding this man? They had not a shred of evidence against him, and they had held him 15 years without trial. And they invented the charge of insanity because they said he was incapable of participating in his own defense. Uh, that had been brought about by uh, the Justice Department, came to him and said, well, Mr. Char uh, Pound, uh, you have a capital charge against you. How are you going to defend yourself? And Ezra said, I will stand over every word I said over a radio room. Because he had broadcast to the whole world over radio room uh, about the Second World War. And so the they, uh, this put them in consternation because they didn't want, as we were repeating all the charges against Roosevelt, which he made over the air. And so they called in eight psychiatrists who pronounced him insane, that he couldn't participate in his own defense. Eight, uh, eight psychiatrists, you say? Eight psychiatrists, eight and government they psychiatrists. And they all said he was nuts, huh? And they, ah. they all said he was Well, they, they couldn't insane. bring him to trial yeah, right. because they knew they had no case. Uh -huh. they, were, they could not have a case of treason against somebody who had not committed treason. Well, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt, was a traitor. Well, I was well sure he was, he was but he by was the time, a... see, they didn't incarcerate, they didn't gain Ezra Pound's so, capture well, I you until Franklin was dead. Franklin died in April of 45. They captured Ezra in July of 45 in Italy. Uh, what, when they captured him, what did they do to him? Well, first of all, a team of communist assassins was sent out in Italy to capture Ezra and kill him, just as they killed Mussolini as, as their mistress. And a car shot it full of holes. And uh, so here yeah, they are searching for Ezra. And Ezra's wandering around Italy and uh, had no dial. Of course, he must have known they were going to kill him because they, these people are all assassins. And they run just like the mafia and have hit in. And so this Thomas team of assassins was looking for Ezra to, uh, to assassinate him. And uh, he invaded them. And, uh, he was initially captured by the United States Army Patrol in Italy. Did Ezra recognize that Franklin Roosevelt was a communist himself under the guise of democracy? Well, he didn't know about Algiers. He didn't even know that Algiers had gone up the charge against him. Right. But Frank, he knew Franklin Roosevelt, and he knew what he was, his yes. agenda was. Yes, because Franklin D. Roosevelt, as president, had three personal assistants. And they were Alger Hess and uh, Harry Desker White mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, Louis Rankin. And those were his handlers, just like uh, Edward are. Mendel House had been Woodrow Wilson and Alexander Hamilton was George Washington and so forth. And all three of these assistants were lifelong KGB agents and they, and they reported directly to Stalin in Moscow. So everywhere. 
that uh, right. grows outside of these three instances for the Beta Ajana, or for the Moscow. And so, Can I get the miracle rates are not this. Sure. Right, you in my way? Sure. <laughs> so that's a real story of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Yeah. President Roosevelt had three personal citizens who were KGB agents. And had never told the American people to this day. They had no idea where the president is. Maybe in the pay of the end. Um, Mr. Mullins, if I could ask a quick question. Why specifically did they want to assassinate uh, Ezra Pound? Well, because these were the worst enemy. The Communist Party of the world had no greater enemy than Ezra Pound. Because had he written a book exposing them, is, or, or what? No, he had attacked them on worldwide radio. Oh, I see. He had a radio program through the 30s. He attacked them uh, daily. And into the 40s. Uh, and Italy. that is why they adopted... Oh, from Italy. Oh, I see. And that is why they adopted Stalin's favorite technique of labor here, a mental patient. Out of, out of nowhere, they get a lot of charge of insanity. Good way to put it, yeah. Ezra Pound was an expatriate born in Idaho, and because he was a poet, had gone to London and then uh, Paris and wound up in Italy, as many uh, artists have done during that time. Well, he was, he was a very celebrated poet. Yes, a very oh, right. celebrated, the most celebrated and, and poet of the 20th century. That's right. The, liberal, the liberals just, just loved him. As far as I am concerned, being a lowbrow, I couldn't, I couldn't even understand his poetry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, his poetry was in Chinese. Yeah, that's right. Uh, not really the Chinese yeah. language, the Chinese ideograms. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he didn't attract too many followers. That's right. Because I couldn't read a word. Yeah, you had to have a college education in <laughs> Confucianism. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. How much more time you got in that thing? I, I got plenty of time, but uh, do we, maybe we need to be wrapping it up? Yeah. Okay, so just uh, just to, just to wrap it up, uh, uh, the, I guess the when you came up with the uh, with your book, the secrets of the Federal Reserve. Uh, nowadays, every conspiracy uh, book you know mentions about how the Federal Reserve is privately owned and what have you. When you wrote the book, that was sort of like unheard of, right? You were the first one that uh, brought out to, that out to the forefront. When I went to the Library of Congress. And don't book on the federal credit system. See, Ezra. Well, what prompted you to go to the Library of Congress? When I went to the hospital to visit Ezra, the first thing he asked me was, will you go to the Library of Congress and look up the federal credit system? And you went the next day. And and I started. went the next day, and I went every day for the next three years. And uh, so I found that, the first thing I found out, there was no book on the federal credit system. And I saw, well, where did I start? <laughs> I had no idea. Well, those listening to this might be interested in knowing that Eustace is a speed reader and read 25 to 30 books a day. Not not small books, but wow. Library wow. of Congress books. Five and six hundred pages of books on economics. That's what I was reading at, at the rate of 15 minutes each. <laughs> and oh that was God. for three years. Now, you got a job at the Library of Congress. Oh, yes. The uh, Library of Congress personally hired me after he gave the valedictorian address at the Institute of Contemporary Arts. And uh, then I read some of my poems at the CD, and he hired me on the spot. And you worked there for a, a, a year? A year. And then what happened after a year? At the end of a year, the Anti-Defamation League had already determined that I was the most dangerous enemy that they had. And uh, Jeffrey Hoover labeled me that publicly, the most dangerous man in America. Which to the communists, I, I wasn't. Well, yeah, I'm right you were. <laughs> <laughs> and so they led on to me, yeah. and they, they've stopped attacking me ever since. So what did they do to you at the Library of Congress? 
They fired me on the spot. Uh -huh. The only man in America, or the only person that's ever been fired from the Library of Congress for political reasons. Yeah, that's true. And uh, only one of two. Who was the other person fired? Uh, Walt Whitman, a very famous poet. Walt Whitman was fired wow. from the Library of Congress. So only those two men. Well, you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, yes. He wasn't fired for the same reason you were. Uh, no. He was fired on his morals because uh, Walt Whitman was homosexual. And what he liked was a burly farm boy. So uh, anyway, when you when they fired you at the Library of Congress, what did you do? Well, I had no money. Uh, and, uh, and no job. And at this time... You could only get a, a room on Capitol Hill on for a dollar a night. And where did I go get a dollar a night? So I was familiar with every nook and cranny of the Library of Congress. I had a stack permit that enabled me to go anywhere in the Library of Congress on my own initiative and free to go wherever I went. And one place that I uh, found out was a, um, a distant relative of mine named Catherine Sprague Coolidge. And Coolidge was, President Coolidge was one of her uh, uncles. And so um, I found she built a, an auditorium on the ground floor of the Library of Congress, which had a uh, an apartment in it with a, uh, a cot that you could lie on and uh, a small bathroom where you could uh, carry it and sell certain boxes. So when they fired you from the Library of Congress, you just moved in? I moved in because I had an enormous apartment in one of the biggest buildings in Washington and time to myself. And you lived there for how long? I lived there for a year. So you moved into the Library of Congress for a year, unbeknownst to to the authorities, or I never told one person where I was. <laughs> when they would lock up, they just locked you. You would uh, disappear into your apartment below, and they would lock you in. Well, they they ushered everybody out, and then they locked the doors. And so I walked out with them when they ushered us out. And I walked right back in. <laughs> went to my apartment. Uh, well, now I just want to want to point out that. Uh, what year was that? 1950. 1950. Okay. Now here it is. It is 2009. So 59 years after that, we have legislation in Congress. That's right. To to investigate the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Finally. Uh, one one congressman is um, he's undoubtedly uh, uh, knowledgeable by, by your book's uses uh, representative Ron Paul Republican from Texas has introduced these uh, uh, this legislation and and now it has well over 200 I think 240 or something co-sponsors to investigate the Federal Reserve the Federal Reserve is going bananas all over there uh, uh, Bernanke, the uh, the head of the uh, Federal Reserve, is, uh, is, uh, is just about off his gourd because uh, people are discovering. Finally, it takes 59 years to, for the for, for a, a significant uh, number of Americans to realize that the Federal Reserve is a privately owned and privately operated uh, uh, a group uh, uh, that 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 controls. The American money uh, in, in in flat contradiction uh, to the Constitution. It's a criminal organization. Our money is issued criminally uh, by international bankers. I defy anybody to say that's not true. Thanks to you. Well, Eustace is the one that spilled the beans, so to speak, on the whole Federal Reserve and governmental system that we now have. But something that's important to understand is that nothing, absolutely nothing happens. It wasn't Franklin Roosevelt that, that said that nothing happens except that it's planned by them. It's planned. So what we don't understand 
is that even by their estimation, the Federal Reserve has come to the end of its road. That's the reason that they, they're planning to destroy their own system. Now, we mm -hmm. say, why in the world would they do that? It's not that they're going to destroy what the control that they have. But it's just like somebody going bankrupt. When you reorganize, you reorganize under a different name. Right. They're planning. It's their plan, which is why they have sponsored so many plagiarizations of his books. They were behind the, uh, the John D. Rockefeller organization of the John Birch Society are the ones who sponsored this person that wrote the monster of Jekyll Island, or a similar name. Great. That sold two million copies of his book, The Secrets of Federal Reserve. He printed, at, printed two million copies. At twenty dollars a copy is forty million dollars that they made off of his book. Well why would they do that? Mm -hmm. Because they, they don't, don't mind the secret's out. They don't mind publicizing the fact that the secret is out. And the more things that you can get out there, the more you water down his writings or his studies, his books. Why would they sponsor his book under a different title and by a different so-called author? Because well, that's part of the plan. In my first edition of the Federal Reserve System in 1952, I said this is a political conspiracy. And uh, I thought uh, that was too strong. And I never heard one word on the Federal Reserve System. Nobody challenged you on that statement. No, indeed. And I got so, I started going to the Federal Reserve Building headquarters myself. And I talked to the people there. And they always talked to me. You were actually quite friendly, and they were friendly to you during all this time. Yeah, because they wanted to meet me to see where I was coming from. <laughs> and I didn't tell them that you had sent me. <laughs> well, uh, so what are they going to do? Uh, They're going to just you. Uh, you agree that that they that their aim is to internationalize American money? Absolutely. Uh, to, uh, to put on an international basis, uh, to uh, uh, to ensnare us uh, finally into a, into a world system. Who was it responsible for allowing the Federal Reserve Act to be passed? Uh, Carter Glass, the Senator from Virginia, who was in the hands of Kumlo Company, the Rothschild Banking Organization. But they were the handlers of somebody in this nation that was that they put in as president. Oh, Woodrow Wilson was personally handled by Colonel Edward House. And who was Edward House during the Civil War, which uh, Abraham Lincoln had personally started by attacking the South with his armies. Uh, that cut off the cotton from the mills of England. And England was going bankrupt because they couldn't make any uh, cloth. And so they had to get cotton to England. Well, Colonel House organized a blockade running organization out of the United States. And they, during the entire Civil War, Colonel House supervised the running of the blockade and furnishing Manchester mills with American cotton. Well, we're putting a lot of pieces of the puzzle. It's all together. Uh, it's all went on. All those pieces go together, but we're dealing with with uh, Woodrow Wilson. Oh, yeah. The point that I was trying to make, Woodrow Wilson was responsible. What, what was his number one aim in his presidency, or at least at, toward the end of his presidency? Well, he was a lifelong communist who sent his own secretary to represent the United States at the Soviet Parliament. But he wanted to get the League of Nations. The League of Nations was Woodrow Wilson's baby. Well, that was his first attempt at a world order on an international scale. Which is another one of your, title of another one of your books, The World Order. Mm -hmm. Not the New World Order, that's their, uh, their plagiarization. Of, I mean, the, world or, the New World Order and the World Order go way back in history. Oh, they do. And uh, as president of Princeton University, uh, Woodrow Wilson was in personal charge of the sons and daughters 
of the American millionaires for sponsoring the Federal Reserve Act. But they, he wanted to establish the world order at the time, which was uh, the League of Nations. Of course, the United States Senate and Congress did not want any part of that. Absolutely not. They didn't want to give up the national sovereignty. But it was finally done, yes. called by a different name, the United Nations. Oh, that was not until after World War II. I, I know it. But they finally got the, the League of Nations or the World Order. What's the, what's the uh, outcome of the new, of the United Nations? The United Nations is the world order. Of course. So the world orders, the, the United Nations idea is a totally communist deal, just like Woodrow Wilson's uh, of course. League of Nations, mm -hmm. and just like Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the one responsible, even though he was dead by the time they brought about the, the uh, United Nations, he was the one responsible for getting it done. Yes. And Franklin D. Roosevelt, whom Wilson appointed as Secretary of the Navy, was Franklin D. Roosevelt's, uh, he was entirely handled by Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Franklin D. Roosevelt was a cripple in a wheelchair. And you would expect a man that had this ability to be leading a big country like the United States. But uh, the uh, Colonel House personally handled Bela Moskowitz, a Russian communist, to handle uh, Woodrow Wilson's and the Roosevelt's candidacy of the presidency. And she pushed it right through. She had a very able alliance of uh, communists, Zionists, and labor leaders which put up the United Front, and the first elected uh, Al Smith has been in 1928. And uh, the second was uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1932, which was the beginning of downfall of America. Wow. And the see, later beginning of the downfall of America, yeah, because all these... Uh, they had many presidents and senators and congressmen that were part of the whole mix. Oh yes, all the way through. They were all recruited into the Communist Party through Franklin D. Roosevelt. Well, Woodrow Wilson really wasn't even a legitimate president. No. Who was the legitimate president in 1912? Uh huh. Robert Taft. Who who was the incumbent? He was the incumbent, and he was a 400 pound man, and during very popular with the country. Uh, during a past president, uh, the country was unusually prosperous and un uh, unbelievably united. And uh, the country was uh, faced a great future on the path. So they had to have Woodrow Wilson uh, sign the Federal Reserve Act into law under his signature. Because Howard Taft was not going to do that. I uh, know. And other financiers had declined to participate. He had betrayed his his handlers. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was one of was uh, the first Judas goat, if you will, of the 20th century. And they got him in there. They told William Ta uh, they told William McKinley, who had betrayed them. Uh, that if you don't take uh, Teddy Roosevelt as your running mate, you're not going to be elected. So he uh, gave up his the vice president that he had had in 19 or 1896 as his running mate, and took Teddy Roosevelt as his 1900 uh, I see. Uh, vice presidential candidate. When he did that, he signed his death warrant because they were planning to to assassinate him as soon as as soon as uh, they made their vows or he made his vows as president again. Oh, so Roosevelt picked up as vice president. He wasn't elected on the right. first time. Was a, he was an appoint, appointee. Right, he was right, a, right. He was right. an appointee president by the banks of England 
Right. Um, and didn't they, they assassinated Garfield right after he exposed, they, they, he said some famous comment where he exposed right. the, uh, the money uh, As soon as powers. he made his, uh, his uh, bow to the, to the Constitution. The inauguration. To be, his inauguration. Uh -huh. As soon as he had his inauguration, that made Teddy Roosevelt legitimately in line. And as soon as, right after that, within, wow. you know, within a couple of months, wasn't it? A couple of months. I've got a, a paper on the assassination of, of McKinley and, and exactly when it went. It was a couple of months after the inauguration. It was a planned thing all the way along the line to get Teddy Roosevelt, because Teddy Roosevelt was to bring about the 1907 uh, bank crisis. Crisis. So uh, all, all this, uh, uh, all, of these all this posturing by, by right. Teddy Roosevelt Every going against the monopolies and the trust bet. buster, that was, all a, that was all a, a fraud. That was all a, a front and a fraud, and to make it look like Teddy Roosevelt was really us when he was a Judas goat. Wow. And he was setting everything up for, they, don't, they couldn't do things immediately. They couldn't bring all these things about immediately. It's a long, drawn-out uh, process over many uh, administrations and generations. It's a conspiracy. You have to put your agents in, you bring them in, and put them in positions of power. And the first thing Teddy Roosevelt did at the White House was to move into the White House George Perkins. And George Perkins was J.P. Morgan's personal assistant. So in other words, the White House had now become an agency of J.P. Morgan. So this was wow. all orchestrated from the beginning. Wow. Uh, right down through the line. And this is history that nobody knows or understands. Mm -hmm. And all this history came from the Library of Congress. Absolutely. Wow. It's all written down. It's all documented. Nobody can argue against it uh, because this is documented history, not the propaganda that we hear. Of course. Uh, of from course. The history Channel or from. From, from the, the court movie. historians. Right, or from even from our educational. Uh, and I knew when I wrote the Federal Reserve conspiracy that this scam was so apparent to everybody that uh, it couldn't last more than 25 years. And so uh, Woodrow Wilson signed the, the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. Teddy Roosevelt was behind getting Howard Taft elected. Yes. Because he thought he was in his pocket mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and would go according to the handlers. There's always handlers of the, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England, the first bank of the United States, the second bank of the United States, and the third bank of the United States called the Federal Reserve. They named it that because they couldn't name it the third bank of the United States. Yes. Right, right, uh, right. The corner of the name of the Federal Reserve System was Paul Warburg. Right. The uh, chief assistant to the Rothschild Bankers. Of course. All done down in Jekyll Island. <laughs> the famous Jekyll Island trip. And they right. named it the Federal Reserve System because they wanted the American people to believe it was federal and it was a legitimate government operation. And so, that it had reserves. <laughs> right. So Howard Taft, a true uh, patriot uh, president, went against his handlers and so they call Teddy Roosevelt who is on uh, in Africa on safari in Africa for three years and they call him and said you got to get back over here things aren't going like you uh, we need you back in charge and so then, he comes back he ran as an independent ran under the bull moose the bull moose uh, and, and, and got Wilson elected on the town. Right, right. It, it didn't work because Howard Taft still won. He was so popular. They couldn't elect Woodrow Wilson, whom everybody hated. Woodrow Wilson was a sergeant. He was an organ. He had no personal feeling in human body parts. Nobody liked Woodrow Wilson. He was a nobody. He was so disliked that when he signed the Federal Reserve Act in law in 1913, had no chance of getting it through Congress. And so they had to go to Virginia and pick out Senator Carter Blass to 
Shepard they built two covers there. They didn't build no covers But let's look back at, at Woodrow Wilson. He wasn't despised and hated by everybody because somebody wanted him there. Oh, the, he was loved by the directors of the National City Bank. And <laughs> there you go. Which happened to be the Rothschild Bank of New York. Well, gentlemen, uh, it's been a great interview. We could go on and on I for know. a long time. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, well, I wanted to tell you yes. uh, that you had to have to realize that Woodrow Wilson was legally defeated for the President of the United States in 1912. Oh, wow. But they came to him and offered him a different position. If he wouldn't fight the, the lost oh, election on his... Part, they offered him. Uh, I'm sitting here. The uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Which he had for the next eight years, and that satisfied him. So uh, Woodrow Wilson was totally an, a total illegitimate wow. president. They were never elected. I never elected. Wow, wow. And many other things like that in history that we're just not aware of. And Taft was, um, was legally elected president in 1910. But if uh, he was elected, uh, but the fact is, they made it a uh, Wilson signature on the Federal Reserve Act to make it legal. And without Wilson, uh, nobody. Well, Mr. Mullins, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to have to cut it short because everybody's going crazy over here. Uh, Maybe we'll continue it a bit later or another time, but it's really been a pleasure uh, talking to you, and uh, you're just a wealth of information. I mean, I don't know what to say. And, uh, if you know this information, you're wealthier than everyone.